everyone. I'm Maria Shemkalian, the Vice Chair of Pennsylvania Film Industry Association, and I'm very excited about our wonderful guests today, Fred Breeze and Rachel Clooney, who represent Glass Entertainment Group, which is local Pennsylvania filmmaking company. And they've been around for almost 20 years, and uh, many of you actually participated on Pope, which was filmed recently and narrated by Liam Neeson. And there were also many other fantastic and famous projects like Taint and Dangerous Ground and uh, other ones that we're going to get to hear about. So, Fred and Rachel, can you please tell us the first question is always, how did you get started in this competitive and difficult industry to break into? Um, I'm Rachel Clooney. I'm a line producer at Glass Entertainment Group. I got my start back in 2011. I went to Temple University, majored in broadcasting, telecommunications, and mass media, which is a very long, uh, <laughs> what it once was, very long word for basically media communications. And I actually started out wanting to go into, I wanted to be an audio engineer, and then I took a few intro TV classes in college and kind of fell in love with it and, and really then changed modes to TV production and concentrated in that. And I, you know, found what was now, what's now Glass Entertainment Group was called Nancy Glass Productions, and I found them online. I wanted to do an internship with them. I got that internship my senior year. And I learned a ton when I worked there and kind of just stayed in communications after the internship because I just really liked the company and wanted to work there and wanted to just kind of do whatever it took to get there. And just, you know, kind of kept hounding them <laughs> until a couple months later, they gave me a job as an office manager and executive assistant to uh, some of the executives and the company owner there and uh, kind of worked my way up and started doing production coordinating, transitioned out into that and started doing some small you know, pilots and smaller projects that they had, they would just throw my way. And then um, you know, I thought I wanted to do creative, but as I started to get more into the production coordinating stuff, I realized that I really liked kind of the putting the pieces together in the sidelines, you know, in the background, kind of doing the more logistics, um, and figuring out how to make that big picture work. So I started just, you know, working on a lot of different reality stuff with them. Um, and I worked on shows like Animal Planet shows. And I actually had an opportunity to go out to Las Vegas and live there for a couple of years and work on a show called Tanked, which was a really impulsive decision, but I was really glad to do it. And it really was amazing opportunity and experience. I learned a lot by doing that and had a great time. Um, I worked on, you know, everything from history channel shows, uh, car restoration shows, a lot of build shows, um, home restoration shows, um, you know, a lot of uh, a pool show, and then um, kind of started getting into some of the more docu-series away from the reality build stuff. And, um, you know, we did Fred and I both did the CNN Pope series, which was, you know, six part historical docu docu series, which was um, scripted. And that was much different. Uh, you know, we did everything from, you know, that historical doc to food network shows, um, studio kitchen shows to, uh, you know, true crime. So we've kind of done a lot and the one really cool thing i've been with the company ever since and really cool thing about staying with them is i feel like i've gained so much experience in the eight years of work there just because i've gotten to do such a wide range of different types of shows and it's everyone is a different challenge and that's what i really like about it because you know i i didn't just stick to one box and i was able to really um, expand on the skills and learn so much and and now I'm kind of a, in the line producer role which um, is just really interesting too because you kind of get to know everybody and you kind of have to deal with uh, a little of everything in a way because you need to know what's going on on the big picture scale at all times and it's really fun and it's always interesting it's always a new challenge and it's um, you know a, a different type of work, but uh, it's been really rewarding and exciting too. Yeah, it looks like 
every day is an adventure and all within one company. So it, sound, it sounds great. Thank you, Rachel. Hi, everybody out there. My name is Fred Breeze. I am also a television line producer at Glass Entertainment Group. Um, I've been active in the industry since, um, wow, uh, it's been about 12 years uh, this month, um, almost to the day. Um, I had gotten my first job at Center City Film and Video as like a 21 year old. I was an associate producer and we produced a lot of content for um, Comcast On Demand before they had their like humongous library of content from every network. We were kind of producing the, 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 the content that was the proving ground to show that it was a viable platform, the, the video on demand platform. So right here local in my backyard, you know, I was born and raised in Philadelphia, um, also a Temple grad. Um, same degree just a few years earlier uh, as Rachel. Um, worked on a lot of that uh, video on demand stuff, eventually worked on a, a um, doc series for a &E where Tony Danza taught at what was my old high school. Um, that was a six part series on A&E. Um, everything from Jersey Shore to Chop to American Idol. Um, a huge competition show for CBS called Hunted. Um, I worked uh, originally uh, for Nancy Glass Productions in 2013 and 14 on Dangerous Grounds, which is another uh, Philly local, uh, Todd Carmichael, uh, co-founder of Lock Loam Coffee. Uh, he had a, an international travel series for the Travel Channel, which um, took us, uh, you know, around, literally around the world in some of the most dangerous places ever. Um, stories from that series alone. Um, you know, I, I used to have a full head of hair back in 2015 <laughs> before I worked on that show. Uh, there's just so many logistics that were involved uh, with that that I'm, I'm kind of a relief to not have to deal with international uh, again. But since then, uh, I left um, I left GEG for a couple of years, came back, I worked on a feature film that they uh, produced back in 2016, How to Get Girls. And then from there, um, you know, Nancy Glass started producing uh, true crime series for Oxygen, Investigation Discovery. So I started doing a whole lot of that stuff. Uh, the first one, when Oxygen rebranded, was The Jury Speaks. And then uh, they produced several uh, two-hour specials on various serial killers, from Jeffrey Dahmer to um, Israel Keys to um, Ed, Edwin, Edwin Kemper, uh, who the, the Netflix series... Um, mastermind I think was uh, based on if I'm getting the show name correct so a lot of amazing work has come out of this uh, building right in Bala Kinwood uh, you know just outside Philly very unassuming building that just has dozens and dozens of phenomenal creatives that are all based for the most part right here in Pennsylvania thank you great path to success um, we heard about your educational journey, so thank you for sharing that. And now, what about uh, which uh, skill sets that you have developed or already had in some intrinsic skill sets that really helped you be uh, to to be doing well in this industry? I think I think working in this industry in in the um, in the production in the production management realm, you really just have to be organized, and you also have to be able to manage not only uh, logistics to you know, the projects we're working on, whether it be a feature film or a television series, but also personalities. Um, everyone from creatives that need to be told, um, you know, how, you know, what the budget parameters are and, you know, how, how creative they can be um, to, you know, the, the PAs and the interns who are just starting out. Um, I think you just have to be very even keel. Uh, this is an amazing industry that allows you to not necessarily sit in a cubicle and, you know, exist in a nine to five construct you get to go out there you get to work with amazing people um all the time and, and, and to a good deal a lot of new people on you know each project um so i think the more that one can balance that i think the the more successful um you can be i think personality management is huge um i think knowing how to um say yes while you're saying no and, and vice versa um, is is huge but um, I would say above all it's it's collaboration so you know we're all in this together and uh, I think I mentioned this to you uh, Maria when we initially spoke uh, you know at the end of the day we're just making it you know it, it's not it's not brain surgery we're not curing cancer we're just making a television show but 
it's hugely important because the people that are curing cancer, they need to be entertained too. Right. <laughs> like an antidepressant at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's that's how I've come to look at yeah. uh, <laughs> this crazy world of television. Indeed. How different is reality TV from scripted TV in terms of producing and why do you prefer one to another? Um, you know, I think they're both really different in their own ways. And, you know, nowadays reality TV isn't what it once was like 20 years ago, you know, in the sense that, you know, much of it now is based on true events, but it's kind of up to the producer to manipulate that content, so to speak, in a way that's evolving around their lives and what's happening in their life. And so, you know, whereas in a scripted show, every detail is planned, you know, you have a job for everything on that set, you know, from the wardrobe to the hair and makeup to set design, you know, writers, all of that, you have a huge staff. In reality, it's, it's small, you know, it's bare bones, it might be 10 people, like, and not so planned. And some of it is maybe set up in a way that makes them uh, get to maybe some drama. So the producers may produce some of that drama, but at the same time, most of the time, it's it's really kind of waiting and seeing, and there's a lot more that's up for interpretation and a lot more that's, um, you have a lot more freedom in producing that, which is fun. And some of the best moments come out of the unsurprising, unexpected things that just happen. Whereas in a scripted show, everything is planned you know you don't you can't you don't have the luxury of time or money to waste on seeing how things go in the scene so there's like just that element of surprise and fun and in reality sometimes like i said you, you know you just get some of the best content out of that so i think they're really different and to each his own you know i enjoy scripted shows but i also enjoy reality shows for their own reasons you know sometimes it's a different vibe, you know, sometimes you want to just kick back and watch a trashy, you know, or not trashy, but maybe it's trashy television and just kind of shut off your mind and have fun and just enjoy what's going on. And then other times, you know, you want to watch a serious dramatic show that's well thought out and yeah. feel like, wow, that was the production value is amazing and mm -hmm. that. So um, I think they just have their own elements of, uh, you know, what's what's great about each of them you know in their own right mm -hmm. Re reality tv is such a catch-all term um you know you have um shows like house hunters and it's like you know is, is that fake um you know i think i think a lot of those series are are miss they're sort of misconstrued it's not fake there are aspects of it that are produced for sure at the end of the day you have a production schedule that you have to you know abide by and a date that you've you know agreed to with the network that you have to deliver you know the masters for them to air it um so yeah to a certain extent there are aspects that are produced but what i always say is you know while it might be produced what's happening in those moments is generally you know tends to be real I worked on Jersey Shore and the question I always get from people is, well, how fake is it? And like, surprisingly, not as much as you think. There are uh, story producers that are putting together the, the real story in the field. Um, cast members would tell the, you know, the producers where they want to go and they would have a, you know, a list of pre-approved places to choose from where, of course, they have to be, you know, you know, from a, a logistics standpoint approved um, so they can actually know that they can film there. Um, but then what happens once they're there? That's the magic of TV. That's why we, you know, tuned. That's why, you know, Jersey Short was the juggernaut that it was. So um, I think that reality TV is very much a catch-all term. There are so many subsects of it. And then, you know, even true in the true crime realm that, um, you know, I'm working on, you know, currently, that sometimes gets looped in with reality, but really it's, it's true crime. We're telling a, a cohesive story. Um, you know, we'll, we'll come up with interview questions and, you know, we'll craft the story that we generally want to tell that we're uh, pitching to the network that they're signing off on wanting to tell. But if, you know, in interview, we're interviewing, um, you know, relative to the victim and they share a detail of the case that we had as a producer no idea about 
we're gonna run with it um and and that might spur a new um a new direction of the story so i think a good producer um will will deviate from the script um and i think that you know in interview that's where you're getting the real i i i, I tell everybody this like it's not it's not reality it's actuality you know like you're following what you know has actually happened but to an extent yeah we're we're producing it along so mm -hmm. okay. two very different worlds yeah uh, in scripted and in reality absolutely and are there actually writers who put together situations or maybe some basic dialogues to start off with or they just follow it like you said they're producers who just set the situation and just follow well, I, think, I like, think it depends. Go ahead. It depends on the type of show, you know. I mean, if it's a show that's like Jersey Shore, you know, I don't know if I could speak to that more, but, you know, if it's a show that's a true crime series or, I mean, that's not reality, but let's say it was even a home renovation show, you know, you're following a project that's actually, or a build show, you're following something that's really being built, but, you know, you may have to, have a story producer produce what they call beats, you know, and it'll be, there's always act acts in every single show. How are we starting it? What's the middle? What's the end result? You know, so you do have to still produce these story beats, but then it's kind of left up to your talent to actually produce and seeing what they're going to do with that story point. You know, so in a sense, yes, they're coming up with a, an outline for the show like they would do because like Fred said, you know, a network, they want a specific episode based on a specific concept. And so even though it's reality, you know, you are seeing something that's somewhat thought after before they're actually in scene figuring it out. So it's not like with those type of shows, there is like at least an outline or something that's a producer has put together, but then it can be interpreted in scene by that talent. Yeah, I think also good reality, um, good reality, you know, subjects and like, let's say docu-follows, you know, Real Housewives, a producer might convey, you know, hey, like, what, what is it, what is the event that you're going to tonight? You know, you've had a conflict with so-and-so, um, you know, are you going to bring that up? And, and there's this, there's this give and take between producer and subject. So before you even hit record, you kind of know what you're going after. And, you know, if there are slow moments, a producer might prompt someone. Um, there's something known as an OTF, an on-the-fly interview, where, like, in the moment, you kind of pull someone aside and you ask them to describe what's going on. Or if they're in scene, you might hear, and a lot of, um, a lot of series have kind of embraced, you know, breaking the third wall with a producer, including the producer's question off screen. And then that'll, that'll prompt the subject to, you know, reply back. Mm -hmm. um, so reality um reality has evolved so much over time but um at the end of the day for the most part like what you see is what you get uh it's rel relatively speaking it's a huge misconception that there's a script that someone's uh to follow mm -hmm. um, i have worked on shows where it has been very faked mm -hmm. um but that these days tends to be fewer uh, than, than than not because viewers at home can smell can you know smell right through that. Yeah. And that's that generally speaking, that's not what people want anymore. Yeah. With reality content, crisis management must be double <laughs> double the duty uh because of unex like you said surprises there are many surprises so uh care to share some situations that happened that you handled really well and very proud of and can pass along the words of guidance oh for our liberty to, to discuss some of those <laughs> all right Hey, here's what I would say. We could, we could give you blanket examples. Once, once upon a time, I was pulling a visa to for my crew to go to India, and um, I had Todd Carmichael and his wife Lauren Hart's um, passport uh, in in New York City, and we were supposed to leave, um, I think, like that Friday. So, like, 
was was it um the day before thanksgiving i had to like go to new york with like a uh, a visa expediter and we had to go between like the indian consulate and this outsourcing office and we were like uptown downtown like three different times this guy was literally like we we paid him basically to like go behind the desk and like grease a palm to like get what we needed done um and like very fortunate like I was able to rescue that and they did not miss their flight because it was also doubling as, uh, you know, partly their anniversary uh, trip before we were filming our episode there. And then two days later, our B camera operators uh, passport got stuck in, uh, in, in the same mess and I had to go back up there and rescue it all the same. So that was one of the most stressful and, and I did not do that story justice whatsoever, but, um, when you think something is gonna go smooth just plan the backup for if it like epically fails and then the plan b and c to you know salvage that um <laughs> there's just there's just so much that's come up that generally speaking you know we kind of probably can't share with the masses yeah. um but i will just say it's it's how you it's how you roll with the punches it's how you rebound when you're presented with a problem mm -hmm. i mean working on a lot of done a lot of build shows and process shows in the past and you know you know everything from tanks to home renovation shows and uh car restoration shows a lot of things where it's, things are really out of your control because you're not, you know, you're the producer. You're not the ones actually making these things. You're not the ones actually building these things. So if the timeline, a lot of times it's a timeline, you know, does it get done on time? Like, what are you going to do? You have to, as producers, think on your feet and think, well, okay, we're either going to push this or we're going to make it work as is, or we're going to, you know, restructure this scene to make it work in the space or, you know, there's an issue, you build it into the scene, you know, a lot of times that happens. And so you really see, like you talk about reality, you really see someone working through a problem and seeing what they do as professionals to fix it. And so, you know, we've definitely been in those situations where people are working all night and they're trying, you know, finish up fish tank, you know, to make it a deadline for a, an actual celebrity client that they might have, or, you know, um, transportation issues you know that comes up a lot where it's like oh my god we gotta when you're in michigan and you uh, have yeah. uh, your main talent that can't get out of a flight you know from newark and she's got to make it to detroit the next day or she's literally going to hold up a crew of like 40 people and you know we're not gonna be able to shoot um the wedding ceremony it's like, all right, are we going to put her on, you know, a private charter, a $10,000 private charter, or is there another option? Who do we know here? Who can we contact, you know, with the airlines? What can we, yeah. what can we say? What can we do? How can we just will it to be? Uh, it is a lot of who you know and co making contacts, networking, you know, they say it all the time in this industry, but it pays to know people. And a lot of times it is, as Fred said, greasing palms and figuring out who you can schmooze into helping you in those moments. Okay, so that, that's practical advice we're looking for. Yeah. <laughs> who you can schmooze with to make sure your problems yeah. get solved. But look, but this industry is very much is. who you know. Yeah. I mean, I, I tell everybody, I tell all my interns, PAs, like who you know gets you there, what you know keeps you there. Like uh. you wanna, you wanna like, when you're in the field and you're grinding 12 hour days out in, in a row, days and days in a row, pre COVID, there's nothing more you want than to just go down with somebody to like the hotel bar, the nearest bar, and then just like bitch and talk shit about everything that went on in the day. But like, you know what? We're, we're back at it tomorrow. So the, the more, the more that you can drink a beer with somebody after hours is, is, you know, probably the more likely you're going to be, um, called again after the job. I mean, of course, what you, you know, your ability to, to do that job. Great. It, it is ultimately what matters, but secondary to that, this isn't an industry where we, you know, have to network 
this isn't an industry where we have to be, you know, perfect little, uh, you know, people that, you know, can't break any rules or will get in, you know, trouble with uh, human resources department, so to speak. It's not so, so corporate. I mean, of course, there are rules and regulations, but it's very laid back. And that is a part of the lore for why people will just go out for three months at a time, six months at a time with, you know, a small crew and travel like, you know, every other day or something like that to a new place. Um, people have called reality television a drug, you know, like just the addictive nature of um, the money you can make, the places you can go, the people you can meet. And um, it's, I've been there. I, I, I totally get it. It's, uh, it's an amazing industry if, um, if you've got the right chops for it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, knowing how to talk to people, how to bond with people, in addition to obviously being good at your job. So networking, again, is the key. And that's something that we, uh, we have been getting as an advice through almost every webinar, that this is the industry of six degrees of separation. Totally. So, yeah. So being nice to others and befriending everyone you meet in this industry. Absolutely. I, my, the, the, um, the TV show I mentioned earlier, Tony Danza taught at my old high school. I was trying to get hold of anybody and everybody that could get me on that show. And I happened to work with a sound guy who uh, saw how hard I was just hustling around set. And I had, hap I happened to mention that I wanted to work on the show and he was, um, you know, just talking to me about it and, you know, probably giving me, you know, practical advice as, you know, a 22, 23 year old. And I get a call from him the next day and he's like, hey, Fred, man, you know, uh, my buddy, uh, Nick, he uh, happens to be the production coordinator and uh, they're looking for PA. So I gave him your name. And like, that was like nine months of work in my old high school. It was very, very full circle, but yeah. it's kind of what you put out there and the impressions you leave people. People will go to bat for you. If you are young and hungry, and I know it's an overdone cliche, um, you will good people stay working you yeah. will you will have no shortage of work mm -hmm. yeah and take opportunities as they come i mean i'm a prime example of just making decisions really quick when opportunities came my way and you know next thing i knew i was living in las vegas for two years you know i got asked and three days later i was like there you know yeah. <laughs> like anyway awesome. um and just doing things also outside of the box that you don't necessarily think that you could see yourself doing sometimes are the best opportunities and experiences because, you know, you don't want to paint yourself into one box all the time because then you get stuck being stagnant, doing the same things. If you take things as they come and take experiences, even if they're not maybe your first choice of job, often you learn a lot more and you're actually better to, you know, work in, all realms of production and this industry. Sure. And maybe those doors will open other doors. Exactly. Yeah. And you, and you meet a lot of different people that way. Yeah. Not keeping yourself in one box and being so rigid, you know, rigid in your opportunities and experiences. Yeah. Thank you. And how do film companies select projects nowadays? Um, television production companies are a bit different, I, I think, than uh, film production companies. Um, we have a department uh, that's in charge of uh, developing new show ideas. We have individuals who are scouring the internet for talent, for um, just people that are just genuinely interesting. Um, and then we will write up a treatment um, and pitch that to the network. Um, we have an agent that represents us and they'll set up meetings for us. And, you know, the other side of it is Nancy Glass is just very well connected. And, you know, she has friends at many networks from, you know, all of the television that she's produced. So um, we, have a, we have a good line in as to what networks are interested in. And if we sense that there's some interest there, we'll film what's called a sizzle reel, which is a, you know, two to five minute um, pitch tape. And um, it's like, here's what the show could be. And, you know, we'll film that on spec that comes out of, you know, our pockets. Um, but it's with the promise that it intrigues them. Um, they, you know, potentially will 
allow us to shoot a pilot, which um, will be, you know, fully funded. And then we can go out there and put it together and edit it and, you know, hope like hell they, um, you know, give us six episodes, 10 episodes, 13 episodes, you know, or more. So um, if you have an idea on your own, the unfortunate thing is chances are you're not going to get into the room to pitch it to the network. But the good news is if you um, have a, a concept that you're, you know, really passionate about, um, you can partner up with a production company, um, you know, like Glass Entertainment Group. If you have a really good idea, I'd say get it on paper, um, know it inside and out, have access to the talent, have access to, you know, whatever the subject matter is, and just become an expert on on, on what it is. Because, you know, the, the, the next step is pitching the production company to work with you. Why is it a good concept? Where do people, who's going to watch this? Where where do you see it living? Um, why do people care? Um, but if you intrigue uh, the production company, they may work, they may choose to work with you and uh, develop it together and then starts the process of pitching it to the networks. Mm -hmm. What is usually a must when uh, the filmmakers who put together maybe a, a nice YouTube series that seem to be working and they want to partner up, uh, what would you expect to see in the professional, well-prepared pitch? I don't quite know how to answer that, but I will say this. Um, there were a couple of young filmmakers at the University of Pennsylvania who approached Nancy Glass with a crazy idea for a movie, and they were uh, incredibly tenacious and passionate about it. And it ended up uh, it ended up getting made into a film, which is um, found on Hulu, How to Get Girls. Mm -hmm. So I think that if you have something that you've produced um, and you know you have a web series that's established, I'd say keep doing it. I'd say the most important thing is to grow your 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 base viewership as much as you can. Um, one of the things that um, development departments at uh, production companies look for are followers. I mean, that's kind of just the nature of the beast. How many built-in eyeballs are there to the subject that, you know, we're going to pitch to a network? Do they have a following? When selecting crew for projects, it's not so much about the resume as much as it is about the person. Of course, I want to see what have you worked on. Show me that you have relevant experience. Show me that, you know, you did everything you could as a recent graduate to just amass some experience, um, you know, over the summer before, you know, applying for a job, you know, first of October. Um, ideally, I have, I, ideally, I'm getting recommendations from trusted colleagues. If um, there is a camera guy I like, if there's a director of photography I like, I'm going to say, who do you want to be your first AC? I've got amazing recommendations, but who do you want? And, you know, it's going to ultimately follow who they want. And there are people that they work with who've become, you know, some of their best friends. And it's for a reason. They do really amazing work. Um, they can make the grueling hours on set really really fun um that 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 says a lot i think that attitude is is almost as important as you know one's craft you know you if you don't have a great attitude i really don't care if you're amazing at your job i will take slightly less amazing with a much better attitude any day it will one person who has a poor attitude on set is going to just ruin, could potentially ruin morale for all. And, and I've been there. Rachel has been there. I think we've all been there. There's unfortunately just one curmudgeon who you leave and you're just like, why are they even here? Um, yeah. And I, and I think, you know, knowing again it, it does come down to who you know again but i mean i i always i'm willing to take a risk on somebody i wouldn't say risk but you know, a chance. somebody i don't know necessarily but if i have at least a recommendation or a referral from somebody like i always do like to vet people at least do you have a reference you know 
um, if they haven't worked before, it does come down to personality and it is very much like, how does this person sound? I mean, you can quickly, in a few minutes of talking to somebody, know a little bit how they're going to be. And I think it really does go a long way if somebody is, has a great attitude on the phone, sounds eager, sounds, you know, really excited to take the work. If somebody is just kind of like, yeah, I'll do it. You know, <laughs> it's like, exactly. it doesn't <laughs> vibe, you know, I, I definitely want somebody who wants to be there and is excited and immersed in it. And again, like knowing people having those references and if somebody says something good about them, of course, like you want to, you want to try and work with them. Um, and then a lot of times it is, you know, people that you, you know, and from a trusted colleague, um, but uh, there are going to be those other times where we turn to resources like Staff Me Up, um, where we just haven't filmed in a place and we need to find a production assistant or we need to find a crew member. The first thing we're going to look at is who replies to our posting. And then we're going to look at their credits. And, you know, you can generally, generally speaking, you're going to see who has, you know, the most credits, the most solid credits, who has a, a, well-written cover letter who has a cover letter at all i mean it's a little it, it's a little aspect of of the overall you know job hunt but it's so huge in fact when i post when i make a posting and we used to have a ping pong table at glass entertainment group and um i used to end the posting with like and your ping pong game must be a plus just to see who would read to the bottom and like reference it back and there have been people that have referenced it back and I've like always made them like my first calls and usually I would like hire them it matters like people that like read to the bottom and and they're picking up what you're putting down like it matters yeah, yeah and then those instances would staff me up or other sites like that where we really don't know somebody um you are looking at those credits and if, and you are looking at that cover letter and if that CV, even if it's a couple sentences, if they've done even just a little bit of, oh, this is the job, let me actually write for this job in particular, like that goes a long way. Like don't just write some blanketed thing. Like obviously you wanna see someone who has a little bit of relevant experience to the type of project that it is. And if they at least looked like they tried to incorporate something that fit with that, you know, that always goes a long way versus just kind of sending out their generic. Tailor your resume to the job that you're applying to. Tailor yeah. your cover letter to the job you're applying to. Um, if, if, I'm, if I mention that it's a, a, a true crime project, drop in there that, um, you know, your, what your favorite true crime series is. You know, tell me that you're a diehard fan of forensic files or something like that. Show me that you know something and I'll take a chance on you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and also if they've done research on your company too, I mean, sometimes yeah. people say, you know, I, I've watched XYZ series. I loved it, you know, and that goes a long way too. just knowing that somebody. They're engaged in media. Their research. They're watching yeah. the television. They're, they're a fan. They're passionate. Um, you have to, you can't half-ass this industry. You, 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 I guess you can half-ass it if you know somebody and you're hooked up with a job, but wow. that, you know, you'll quickly, get you know snuffed out i'm sure if you know you're not getting called back because your true colors you know come out on set and you, you know you're just kind of lame and you're put there because you knew somebody that just you know propped you up but if you make it there on your own you and you're good you will stay there i mean i, I have um i had an old intern who is now going to be the art director on um, on our upcoming uh, recreations for our true crime series. This is a guy who um, has done nearly every production job in just a matter of, you know, probably like three years since uh, he interned with us. And he, he hustled and he had the, the, you know, the right attitude. He was a people person. He was a very hard worker. He was a problem solver. Um, in fact, we lost a location. Uh, that we were supposed to film at, I think the very next day or, or a couple days to come. And I had him leave set with us and basically just start door knocking on people's homes. And in an hour, he landed us a new location that was better than the first. So that's what I look for. Yeah. Can you solve a problem? Great. You know, like what, c come to me with a solution when you're telling me what the problem is, like have that in your back pocket. 
Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also for some of the more long term, um, you know, people that we're looking for, like, let's say it's like something more specific, like an art director or wardrobe person or, or something that, you know, is kind of a bigger deal for us because it's just going to be a longer term hire, you know, a lot of times what goes a long way too is, is this person organized? Is this person communicative? You know, how are they emailing? How are they, you know, conducting themselves in the interview? Um, you know, if you're not interviewing on the phone, like it's, it just goes a long way to see that somebody, how they, um, their initial communications are and their initial like organization of their work, for instance, you know, if somebody has a reel, do they not have a reel? If they have samples of their work. You know, you can easily pick out that person and know, oh, this person isn't as prepared as this person. So yeah, I don't feel great about this because I want to see somebody coming up with their A game and, you know, somebody who's really buying for that job, you can see it pretty quick. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was very elaborate answer and very helpful. So a, lo a lot of points to put together and prepare well for the next submission. So thank you. That was very helpful. Do you have some uh, guidance for those who are starting to get back into the whole COVID air filming, something that helped you with effective financial decisions, something that helped you keep everyone safe while being budget conscious? Is there something that you can now share based on experience, not just guidelines by the guilds and unions? Yeah. Um, so I just finished up a project, the Lincoln Docu series, and you know, actually, when the pandemic hit, we were exactly halfway through our recreation shoots, and so we were planning on shooting in, you know, early 2020, February, March, and then we were going to do the second half in April and May, and then everything hit in March, and we were like, oh my God, what do we do? You know, we had to figure everything out, everything drastically changed. And essentially we had to start from square one in the planning process. And so we, you know, were working with the union, we were working with SAG actors, but our crew was non-union. So quickly we learned that SAG was dictating pretty much everything for not only the cast, but the crew, because really it came down to testing, you know, it was like the number one thing. And so you know, at first everyone was like, how are we even going to do this? You know, how are we going to get back out there in an industry like this? Is this ever going to, we ever going to be able to finish this up? You know, I mean, it, we're just in such a industry and in, in the field with so many people and, you know, you're in an environment where it just feels very like, how are you going to make this COVID safe? And so it just became figuring out how to make it COVID safe. So, you know, for us, we had to basically go back to the drawing board with creative. We had to, our producers had to go back to the scripts that were very carefully written out. You know, at this point we had stuff edited. We had holes in our, our cuts that were built for these specific scenes we had to get. And so they had to go back and basically say, well, how do we make this safe, you know, especially for actors. So things got cut, you know, we had to change the locations. We had to basically, we were supposed to shoot six days in six different locations. It ended up being consolidated to one location. So we had to find something that actually worked for all these scenes. It was not easy. We were in Pennsylvania, so it was good. <laughs> but um, we had to figure out how to um, then cut these scenes, like I said, that fit for that location. And then we had to, you know, figure out how to make it COVID safe on that location with these actors. So pretty much we had to bring in every single thing. We found a place that was a private property and it had outdoor space. It also had a big house that we could do our interior work in. We ended up expanding to eight days of shooting instead of six. So that wasn't budget friendly, but we did get, you know, luckily our network was very, you know, accepting of our overages just because of the circumstances. I mean, nobody even knew if we would finish this thing. So it was kind of like, what are we going to do? Let's just figure out how to make it work. And so, um, you know, we expanded our shoot days. We actually cut down the shooting hours because it was kind of, you know, usually on cruise, you work 12 hours a day. 
we had to cut down to 10 hours a day for the crew to make it safer, which then in turn expanded our, our shoot days. Um, we had to bring in, like I said, every vendor, you know, from tents because of the ventilation um, issues, you know, being um, in buildings with a lot of people. We had to put all of our production people in tents, you know, catering was outside on like TV trays, you know, we were um, bringing in air conditioning for the tents. We had to get fans for our interior work. We only had, we basically did pod systems for everybody. So we did, you know, only 10 people could be inside this huge building at once at any given time. And it was very strict. We had people saying, you know, rotating people out, you know, no department could work at the same time. You know, we had our art department setting up, then lighting goes in, then, you know, the AD goes in with the actors, you know, so it was just really a big dance that we had to figure out. And, um, you know, back to the union stuff, the testing was number one, and that became really the bane of production management <laughs> existence because we had to figure out how to get 80 people tested. Luckily for us, we consolidated into two weeks. So um, why is luckily? Because we were able to do the eight days as in a row as possible. So the, the union wanted us to test basically twice a week for everyone. And so we had to figure out then a testing schedule for all these people because some people don't work on the same days as others. So previous to getting on set, everyone had to get a test as a prerequisite. So then suddenly, you know, that was a work requirement to get a test and make sure it comes back negative. And then once you get on set, we were doing testing basically every other day. Mm -hmm. You'd have to, you know, figure out if anybody came back positive. You know, we didn't do quarantining with each other. We didn't do like what they call a bubble where everyone lives together and works together. We actually just did it so that we just tested pretty much constantly as much as we could. And we just told everyone, you know, minimize your risk, go home, but minimize your risk by just don't go out to public spaces, you know, be careful at home. Don't, um, you know, do anything that's against the CDC guidelines pretty much. And we were really lucky and we came out, you know, COVID free, but it was extremely tough. And we, you know, the union actually didn't even really know at that time what to do because they, they kept changing their guidelines. We ended up pushing our shoots almost four months at the end of it. So, um, you know, the crew was very, very patient. And, uh, you know, I think everybody, it was really hard in the beginning because we didn't know what to expect. Yeah. People were like, are we going to get back out there? We push it. We push it again. Push it again. <laughs> yeah. Finally, we did get it done and we did it done safely, but you know, it was all about spreading out, testing, and just making sure that you have a really good, um, you know, testing plan. And anything I think is like what helped us and just having the infrastructure um, and being in the summer for us, it really saved us because um, we only had one day of interiors and the rest, we could just be outside pretty spread out. Mm -hmm. um, we also had golf carts to cart everybody around. Um, you know, the actors had to take extra precautions. Um, but, you know, I think all in all, we, we did a good job, but I will say it is not a budget friendly process. <laughs> so, no. And where are you doing? Can't, I can't sugarcoat that. It is not cheap to do it. And the testing, uh, did you say it was on site that you were bringing? Testing? It was. So the testing we had, we actually had to partner up. It was tough. I mean, Fred actually, him and I were like looking for, I mean, he'll speak to his project, but mm -hmm. we were looking for different labs that we could partner up with because the thing we were running into at that time, we didn't have, nobody had really done it yet. So we were kind of one of the biggest projects that SAG had been in talks with doing anything with at that time yet, you know, everybody was gearing up, but no one had really done it yet. So we were kind of at the forefront of that. And so they didn't even have, they had their guidelines, but they didn't have anything really solidly um, in place yet. So we were all kind of like 
just flying by the seats of our pants and just figuring it out as we went, which was pretty scary leading up to it. But um, with the testing, yeah, we figured out that we had to partner with the lab because the test, you know, everyone was getting tested at their, if you did it at your leisure, it could take up to a week to get your results, you know, if not more. And so what was the point? We were done shooting by then. So we had to basically get a lab that could guarantee us the results within two days was the quickest that we were able to find. And so we had a set medic who was authorized to do the testing, who was with us every day. We got basically these test kits sent to us. We would have a schedule, everyone would get tested on their days, and we would turn around the results next day to the lab, and then they would send us the results another day after that. So from the time you tested to the time you got the results, it was less than 48 hours. And then, um, like I said, they would come like every other day and do that. And so that's kind of how we managed it. But the process was definitely tedious. Um, you, you finally, it's like you get into the groove once the thing's over <laughs> pretty much. But um, lucky for us, like I said, we did it in two weeks, our shoots. So it was kind of easy to manage. If it was a longer term project, I would understand why you would want to really put people in a bubble and make sure that people are minimizing exposure at home and, and stuff. Uh, yeah how much should filmmakers now allocate more towards the budget uh, for the covid related needs approximately probably a tough one to answer it's going to be based on um it, there's there's a lot of considerations right you know that you need to base that off of um how many people are on set how many talent you have on set on any in any given day i think there really is no way to base a percentage of uh, budget off of that, but you can take a look at your creative and what your projected schedule looks like and um, assess how many individuals you'll have on set. And we're talking about like the people that need to be there that aren't, you know, working remote. Um, and then you, you'd probably plan accordingly there. Um, well, but, and the yeah. other thing is the testing is really can be very costly and some networks and you know production companies are paying for these tests and some aren't so for us we were lucky that we were able to absorb that cost you know the, the network was able to cover that cost for us but you know in some of these other projects now especially in the beginning it seemed like people some of these other companies were more willing to pay and now as it gets you know further into this pandemic it's starting to be just kind of assume that you may eventually you're gonna to have to just kind of assume that cost as a company. So um, we are running into that a little bit more now than we were as a company. So um, that's a big cost, you know, but then there's also different ways to do the testing. Like in our case, because of that turnaround and having someone there, that was like pretty much as expensive as it gets. But, you know, in Fred's case, you know, in his show, he's able to get those um, home kits that, are covered through people's insurance and it's free you know and, and so, i mean first and foremost like everyone's safety is important everyone wants to go home to their families at the end of uh the day um no one wants to get sick over their craft um i i <clears throat> the series that i'm working on uh involves travel right now it involves us sending a small crew of uh four to five individuals oh. Um, around the country and yes they're on airplanes and yes they're interviewing a new person each day um, I will test my crew um, inside the week that we're leaving and I'll ask everyone to be very mindful of uh, you know where they're going and basically to you know stay home the days leading up to travel and when they travel on airplanes we're giving them KN95 masks we are booking uh, all of our crew in the same row um, we're instructing them to turn um, the air vent over top of them and aim it at the top of their nose so it creates uh, an airstream around them. Um, what we've read is, uh, you know, the way circulation on airplanes work is that, uh, you know, any germs in your peripheral kind of get sucked down into the return vents underneath your seat and it's based on, you know, like 
clusters of individuals. Uh, we'll always try to book to as far to the front of the plane as possible. And we'll always try and put our, in, our crew in the same row. And if that means booking a middle seat for no one to sit there, and that's going to make, you know, put my crew at ease, we've done it and we'll keep doing it. Um, asking someone to work during a pandemic and get on an airplane when um, the airlines are furloughing, you know, thousands of, in, thousands of employees, that's a huge ask. Um, you know, not to mention uh, interacting with uh, a new stranger every day. We have um, tons of different face. We have <clears throat> we have tons of different face masks. We have face shields. Um, we've got disinfectant wipes. We've got hand sanitizer. We have air purifiers. We have anything and everything that is recommended by the CDC, even down to like UV light boxes where we can take a microphone, put it in the box, UV light will kill the germs after three minutes, you know, anything that you can't, um, you know, wash down with a liquid-based disinfectant. We're trying to do everything in our power that we can do to, to make everyone's job safer. Filming outside, keeping doors and windows open um, while we're setting up, not having the individual that we're interviewing, uh, not having anyone remove their mask, but especially the, the person we're interviewing, uh, not having them remove their mask until um, we're about to start recording the interview. Running the purifier uh, while we're uh, interviewing, just to keep air circulating through the room. Um, going into a place before uh, our crew even steps foot in there and, you know, wiping down high touch point surfaces, you know, doorknobs, railings, um, sink faucets etc um it, it it makes a difference it truly makes a difference temperature checks we're doing that every day um we we just want to make sure that our crew is as safe as possible um we we do require everyone to you know turn in their test results to us and you know nobody uh has any you know issues with that because you know, everyone wants to be safe. And that's what makes this work. That's what makes production work during a pandemic is the willingness of the crew. Um, there are some territories around the country where the ideology behind um, the, the ideology behind the pandemic probably isn't the same as, you know, most places. Um, and, you know, there may be a lack of desire to wear masks, but they need to. Simply put, you cannot be on set if you're not abiding by the, you know, COVID safety plan that's put forth by production. Um, Rachel's had to write them. I've had to write them. We tailor them to our productions. We have experts that weigh in on them. COVID-19 compliance uh, officers are a new role that you're seeing pop up everywhere. Um, on Rachel's set, uh, you know, you have a designated person whose job is entirely that. On uh, a set that, you know, has four or five individuals in the field, you know, my field production manager went through a, you know, safety training um, to, you know, become certified in that. And he is the compliance officer. You know, we have two large pelicans of supplies that we travel, you know, with our camera gear that, you know, we, you know, turn to, to, you know, stay safe. Um, so yeah, it's, Fred it's and I have been training too at, at the company with, we got certified COVID certified, I guess you could call it. And a couple other people at the company too. So, you know, everybody basically just becomes a COVID expert. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Something you wouldn't think of a year ago, right? <laughs> Not even the, the, the concept. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. Way back when, um, way back when, you know, we were all able to, you know, pile together at a six foot folding table. And, you know, now we're literally having lunch on TV tray tables, you know, socially distanced, physically distanced. Yeah. yeah. What a world. Hopefully not for long. <laughs> Hopefully soon we'll be back to normal. Hope so. Uh, now, with, uh, with the actors mostly, but with the crew as well, but with crew, it's a little easier to find a substitution. With the actors on screen, if, God forbid, there's a COVID case and they can be there, do you have to recast or you just wait until uh, 
until the person feels better or do you just rewrite the whole script and change things around and have to keep going? Oh, I think it really depends on the project again, but um, you know, it seems to me like what's happening and kind of what we did is that if it's a main character, if it's like the main character that you've already shot with, you know, in our case, if it was our Lincoln or something, you know, we already shot a bunch of stuff with him and we would have to recast. Um, well, I'm sorry, we would not have to. Yeah. It's too, it's too specific. We couldn't do that. So we would have to just wait and, and basically have him, you know, get better and then push our shoots further and make it work. You know, he would basically be someone who, would shut down the production if he got sick. You know, everybody- There are a handful of key positions, you know, the- Key positions. Yeah. Lead yeah. Camera. But so you kind of, you, you figure it out, who's your key people who would shut down production and who wouldn't. Um, but, you know, as far as actors go in general, um, yeah, if they got sick, they wouldn't be able to come to set. If they tested positive, they wouldn't be able to work and they would have to quarantine for, you know, two weeks and, and get retested until they don't produce that result anymore. Um, and that's kind of the way that we were dealing with it before. I mean, luckily it, it didn't happen with any actors, but, um, you know, that is what we would have to do. And now for actors, it is a prerequisite. I mean, it is for everyone, but especially actors, it's a prerequisite for the job. You have to get tested before you have to produce a negative result or you can't work. With the flu season coming coming up uh, before you know minor cold symptoms a little bit of a runny nose you go back to set you you take that Tylenol and you you head over there but now this is a different world how is it going uh, you know I know that you're not sure in terms of the rules but how do you foresee it working for productions now with the cold season yeah I mean when somebody gets sick the protocols that like Fred was saying, we had to take a lot of time to write an entire guidelines, you know, document, <laughs> like 20 page procedure of different, different things, including contingency plan. And so we, every show now has kind of their own set of guidelines and you have to basically revert back to, refer back to the, the guideline and see what your policy is. So a lot of productions policies are that if somebody is sick, if they're exhibiting symptoms, even if it isn't COVID, it just looks mm -hmm. like a common cold. They do have to leave set and they do have to go and get tested. And they, if they, um, you know, produce COVID, obviously then they would have to quarantine. But if it is negative, then, um, you know, still, if you're sick at all and you have actual sickness symptoms, they don't want you to come to set. So yeah. uh, during a pandemic, during a pandemic, it's binary. It's zeros and ones. It's black and white. Yeah. You're either fine or you're exhibiting signs of illness that are, you know, you should just say, hey, I'm not feeling good and I can't work, unfortunately. I'm happy to replace myself or help, you know, you, you know, replace me. Um, mm -hmm. There but, is no uh, more pushing through. You know, I've seen people try and do it since this started and it doesn't work you know in our industry in the past before this happens we're very much people who kind of tend to work ourselves into the ground yeah get very run down really quickly it's happened to me it's happened to fred it's happened to a lot of people we've known and it's kind of the industry but unfortunately this virus doesn't allow for that anymore not unfortunately fortunately it doesn't allow for that anymore and yeah. so um the good thing is people are more reluctant to, you know, push themselves, but when they do, it is going to be telling and, and we, basically you can't mess with that anymore. Like people have to be healthy. They have to take care of themselves. And we, we are all a lot more forgiving of those things. I think that kind of old standard of just kind of working, just, you know, I guess living to work is hopefully going out the window a little bit more. I think people are taking a little more time to be cautious of their health and wellness and they should, you know, this isn't the time to mess around with that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that, that, that's a major change. Like you said, we, we used to just work as long as we're able to come to work, you come to work and now that's, 
completely different. So that's that's going to yeah. be a big hit on productions, but that's probably better for us as humans. <laughs> yeah, and people don't want people don't want to see sick people on set. <laughs> Especially now, it is people sure. are more cautious of it, and if they see that, they're going to send you home. Yeah. You know, to me, Pennsylvania is one of the great hidden gems of the film and TV industry in this country. And I think, you know, we can do just about anything here. And it's so incredible yeah. that we can because there's so many different looks. You know, we can have rural, we can have New York City, we can have, you know, historical um, locations. You know, for us, even as a company, we've done everything from you know, yard renovation shows to medieval times, you know, era, uh, you know, on, on the Pope, for instance, for CNN, you know, we had, it's a great example. We had incredible locations, everything from, you know, medieval cathedrals to, um, you know, just, it ran the gamut from all the way up through now, you know, of, of those times. And because it's such a historical Place, especially around the Philadelphia area, we can get so many, so many different looks. And, you know, even on the, the series we're doing that I just wrapped up, um, that's a, a docu-series on Abraham Lincoln, you know, same thing, all this stuff in the 1800s that we were able to just get right here in our backyard without a problem. And we filmed everything here in, in the state, you know, and even in Pittsburgh, there's tons of places up there. Know, a lot of people, uh, you know, film New York City there and Philadelphia too. And so it's really easy to do. And we also can produce, we have the seasons here, you know, so we can also do a lot more than say LA. You know, don't get me wrong. I've been on the West Coast. It's great. There's a lot you can do there. The weather's nice, but we just have so much more that we can offer here because we have you know, all weather, we have um, just, like I said, you know, farmland, city life, we have all of that. And so it's it's been really such a sought after place, I think. And um, we've been really lucky, you know, in, in especially Philadelphia to just have so many amazing projects come through, you know, from huge feature films, you know, we had Creed film here, you know, we had um, like all of these, upcoming, you know, M. Night Shyamalan's production companies here, you know, like we just have huge uh, production companies that film here because you can just get so much out of it. Mm -hmm. And not to mention, um, there are a lot of kick-ass crews in, in uh, Pennsylvania. Um, and if we welcome South Jersey into our fold, we get the beach <laughs> and all of that stuff too, um, which is obviously another bonus to uh, base, making your base Pennsylvania. But um, Philadelphia you know, has a great production town. Um, and there's a lot of crews, even just, you know, into Harrisburg, uh, Lancaster, um, really all over the state. And yeah, we have a ton of different looks, so we can really double as uh, anything. Mm -hmm. Of course, it presents a challenge when you're trying to um, film an exterior scene uh, that's to play as Los Angeles um, in the wintertime. There's no... Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's no leaves on the trees yeah that sucks um snow that sucks but, but it's uh, been done it's been yeah. done it's been done and done right and we've got some great studios here too so we can we yeah. can set it up <laughs> we have the infrastructure we just yeah. need to be building it yeah and and it is you know like fred said like a great production town i mean we have a lot going on now as far as just like crews vendors you know everything that you would need for some of these bigger productions you know we we can measure up and it's cool because it is a smaller community. So you really get to know everybody and you get to just feel like more of a sense of community. And so it doesn't feel as like competitive and stuffy as it would in a place like LA or New York. You know, you have that kind of sense of family and community, which is really nice. And you get to know people and there's just so much talent here too. Absolutely. What are the three pieces of advice or maybe lessons that you've learned or possibly mistakes that you've made that you'd like to share with our viewers to help them throughout their path? I will say, um, if you are entering into this industry, 
um, or looking to make a name for yourself, just continue to work, work really hard or continue to work really hard. Um, stay in contact with whomever you meet and not just when you're looking for work, but like while you're working, share what you're doing, um, be outward, uh, don't be obnoxious, be, uh, be friendly and approachable, have people's backs. Um, you know, if you are still in college and, you know, you're, you're a sophomore or something, you know, even a freshman, do whatever you can on a real set. Whoever will have you, small, large, get out there. I wish I could have done so much more. It, it, coming up in the industry, all I knew was television news in Philadelphia. I wanted to be a, a news photographer. And it wasn't until I had my first, um, I, I won this uh, fellowship through the International Radio and Television Society in New York City um, after college for uh, about nine weeks. It was like all expenses paid. And they put me up and uh, arranged an internship uh, at this uh, production company, Sharp Entertainment, one of the truly one of the biggest um, production companies out there. They've done uh, Man vs. Food. And uh, they are the production company of the, the 90 Day Fiance and every franchise uh, that there is of that, among many others. Um, it wasn't until I worked with them that I realized reality television is like a complete other side of TV that was incredible. And I really wanted to work in it. And, and thankfully that, you know, there are some outfits in Philadelphia that exist where, you know, I was able to do that work. So identify early on what you want to do, where you want to be, dabble, make friends, stay in contact with your uh, peers if you are still in school, um, even when you graduate in the years to come. I can't tell you how small this industry is. You will absolutely work with people again and again, and some people you've never worked with at all. Um, but somehow, some way, you tend to know someone through so many degrees of somebody. So just be really careful about, you know, the way you convey yourself, you know, um, just, you, you never want to burn a bridge. This industry, it, it's, it's, it's humongous, but it's still really small. And um, it's still really small and, you know, things can follow you. So just be humble, be gracious, be helpful. Um, how can I help learn, learn, say, say that, say that once to, you know, say that once a day in the mirror, when you wake up, how can I help you? What can I be doing? Even when you think that there's nothing that can be uh, done on set, don't sit down and, and, and <laughs> don't just sit down and do nothing like appear busy. Uh, there's always, always, always something to do on set. Um, just hustle. Good people stay working. Thank you. Um, well, my advice is network, 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 as Fred said, um, definitely get to know people, stay in touch with people, make sure that you are working your connections as much as possible, because this is a who you know business. And I would also say, everything is a negotiation. Don't take no for your first answer. Um, and, you know, basically, don't take that as a first response or reaction because a lot of times things can be worked out and they can be worth your while even when you think that they're not. And also don't say no to things just because it seems like it may be either out of your comfort zone or maybe you feel above something or you don't think you're going to get something out of a new opportunity because a lot of times you get the best experience and you have the most memorable and enjoyable times when you do do something out of the box and maybe that isn't in what you think is your wheelhouse. And you also get to know more people that way too. And, um, you know, advocate for yourself, make sure that you are making sure people know what you're about, what you're doing, what you're up to. Um, make sure that you have samples of your work, you know, you have, credits, you, you're up, you're keeping your resumes up to date, you have um, just actively or just staying active in the industry and that people are, you know, knowing what you're up to. Um, and so that you can be your best advocate for yourself. Thank you. That, that was that was inspiring. To end this wonderful webinar with a lot of fantastic advice that you have offered. 
whom would you like to nominate to offer some words of guidance and wisdom to the aspiring filmmakers and actors? It could be anyone from the industry who is already established and ready to send the elevator back down and help others who are trying to get to um, the I'll interview John Hirsch, VP of Current Programming at Glass Entertainment Group. He, mm -hmm. uh, he's a wealth of knowledge. Um, good guy, now Pennsylvania-based. He was actually born here, went and did the New York thing and then came back down um, and is uh, a, a, an SVP at our company. Mm -hmm. um, Nick Briscoe, uh, another uh, Pennsylvania-based uh, producer, um, became a, an executive producer on Cake Boss, and now I believe he's a VP over at Food Network mm -hmm. uh, in their development department. Um, there truly are so many uh, mm -hmm. individuals, and I'd, I'd be happy to make, uh, make some uh, connections, um, make some introductions, rather, after Thank this. You. Thank you. We look forward to learning from them. Yeah, I mean, there are so many people. I think off the top of my head, I would nominate Veronica Stickelman, who is a producer at our company. Yeah, I've met Veronica. She's great. Yeah, and she yeah. has a wealth of knowledge and experience and has been to uh, done many different things over the years and is also a Philly local. Um, and I would also nominate Bruce Hall, who was our first AD on a couple of the projects, the CNN projects that I worked on, who is an amazing first AD and has a lot of experience and also a really interesting person to talk to. I think he'd be a great interview as well. Super. I'm going to nominate one more. Andrea Gunning. She's both uh, Rachel and I's boss, uh, one of Rachel's best friends. And I will nominate her because she'll lend a unique perspective to some uh, to a new endeavor that she's kicked off at glass which is um our podcast division mm. she um has created confronting oj simpson a podcast she did with um kim goldman um retelling the uh the oj case through her lens uh she's created a, a dating uh dating based podcast um you know, in the beginning of the quarantine that's still going on today, and uh, another uh, another volume of the Confronting series. So from just another, you know, media producer that's not, um, you know, making moving pictures, but uh, telling, still telling compelling stories, um, just orally, mm -hmm. I think that uh, she'd be, she'd be a really uh, solid interview too. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm and excited. she's just got a really interesting story of how she got started and everything too, and got to where she is and started this branch at the company. And she's also just a wealth of knowledge in this industry as well. Thank you very much. I look forward to meeting all your wonderful nominations. And thank you again, Fred. Thank you, Rachel, for your time, for your guidance, for your amazing advice. And I hope that it helps all our viewers. And we're going to see your amazing projects on big screens one day and on all the networks. And you're going to become stars and you're going to achieve all your dreams and goals. So thank you very much for watching and we wish you all best of luck.